Y'all ready to rock? Awesome. I'm Chris White, writer and director of the coming-of-age music movie, Electric Jesus, a story set in a world that might seem like a foreign planet to some people. Electric Jesus, the music behind the movie, is your VIP backstage pass into this crazy world. And in the immortal words of Skip Wick, our Christian rock huckster with feet of clay and a bad toupee, the Rock and Roll Road Show. Praise the Lord and pass the ammunition. Episode 3, The Heart of Jesus Rock is Still Beating, with special guest Glenn Kaiser of Res Band and special appearances by Daniel Smith. John, I think from the earliest drafts of the script for Electric Jesus, there was a song that we had the band, uh, the movie band 316, uh, uh, covering. It, it was a song that the kids in the band wanted to play, wanted to sound like, and that song was called Love Comes Down by a band uh, that on that album was called Res, but um, is known to us as Res Band, Resurrection Band, and today we actually get to talk to the founder, the front man, the, uh, m- the force of Res Band, Glenn Kaiser. Yep. Uh, It's not exaggerating to say that this is a guy that definitely has changed my life, probably more than once. Uh, uh, And a huge honor to have him with us today. And I I told you when we were on set, when when we were filming the band playing this in a rehearsal, in a scene where they're rehearsing, that the lyric of this song, to me, is really the heart of this story. Um, and I won't, I won't give anything else away, but to me, love comes down was really the, um, when you lose, you win. That's just the way it is <laughs> when love comes down. Like it's such a, it's such a simple, powerful idea, but man, it's something that we miss so much. So yeah, uh, let's, let's head into the interview suite with, uh, uh, a man who is a pastor. He is a, a rocker. He is a songwriter. He builds guitars out of cigar boxes and found materials. <laughs> um, he's an amazing gentleman, uh, Mr. Glenn Kaiser. He said that he had your number. Because the telephone line. He said you needed a reason. He said that in one side. He kept trying to avoid He kept knocking on the door. And the passion was over. You were a prisoner of war. Let me start off this this session this way. I just want to ask you, um, going back, I know that you came up during the, what we call the Jesus movement and the, the explosion of like Christian rock music. What were the bands trying to accomplish? What was a Christian band trying to do back when you started out? A bunch of people, a lot of us had come out of drug addiction, whatever. Vietnam, people are shipping people back in body bags, quote unquote race riots, poor black folks getting hammered. And so out of all that mess, people came to faith in Jesus and we were the least likely to succeed at anything. We were, a lot of us were just flat out addicts, you know. So the lights came on. We believed that Jesus is who he said he was in the scripture. He said, go into all the world and preach the gospel, verbally share the, the scriptures that relate to what Jesus said is good news. You know, in a world full of tragedy and and pain and, and uh, heartbreak and injustice, I think almost every one of those early days, solo artists, duos, bands, regardless of music style, were simply trying to share their perspective, their take on who he was and what he had done and what he could do for others, you know, and in terms of the lyrics. And musically, so much of that probably depended on where they were coming from as musicians prior 
to any sense of a relationship with Jesus. What was the church like at that time? What was the standard church world like as compared to you guys out rock and rolling? Then and now, there were people who were a bit more cosmic, esoteric, open to the to young people and open to different culture, subcultural expression, or artistry, music, and all the rest of it, performance. And there were those who, you know, would forbid card playing because it might lead to dancing. You know, so, I mean, there, there were even tradi- more traditional looking, you know, culturally uh, and uh, uh, theologically or doctrinally churches sometimes were very open to the Jesus people. And that's true in the, in the States, Canada, or in, in Britain, in Australia. This was going on around the world, by the way, uh, pretty much all at the same time. And there were those who absolutely, they didn't want to touch any of us with a 10-foot pole. And it was all about, almost all about culture and subculture. Where I came up, uh, where I I grew up in South Carolina, would this may be a a cliche, but would you be a little more uh, nervous about going to South Carolina to play a show than maybe California? (laughs) Not me. I don't know that it's virtue or anything. I don't think it is. But from day one, you got to know. I you know, I'm dead and my life is hidden with Christ and God. Those aren't words to me. That's that's reality in my life. So, Res Band played in Pretoria at the Nationalist University and largely white congregations. We had to drag our white hosts into Soweto and Cape Town and Alexandra and Cape Town. And uh, I mean, to me, it was just like, if you've given it over, then what have you got to lose? I'm, I'm already dead. It's, my life's over. Whether people love or hate me is not going to change my life. But Jesus changed mine and he can change theirs, yours, anybody's. And that's reality to me. That, that's not rhetoric. That's not preacher talk or anything. So, you know, by the time we ended up in the South and doing churches, I mean, they don't know what they don't know. Heck, most black folks can tell you down South, ignorance. Talk about prejudice, racism. So it's just, it's raw ignorance. It really is at core. And it was always about economics, power, control. You obviously had a revelation just culturally that because, you know, I mean, I grew up in the Jesus movement. Before that, my understanding was there's the church and there's rock and roll. And of course, we're not talking about the black church. We're talking about the white church and there's rock and roll and they shall not mix. Right. So when there's a new movement, a spirit led movement where Jesus is appearing to young people who love rock and roll, and they're meeting Jesus, and they're understanding the freedom of Jesus, which includes that rock and roll is not of the devil. (laughs) That's a revelation, right? If you're gonna talk about rock and roll, you're gonna be talking about Elvis. And if you're really gonna be talking about Elvis, you're gonna be talking about Chuck Berry and Little Richard. And pretty soon you keep going, and the occasional rap we heard from the white traditional church, not just in the South, but wherever we might have traveled when we heard this, saw it in writing, heard it directly, heard it from pastors. When they talked about the jungle beat of Christian rock, what were they talking about? I said it a while ago, it's all about money and power. And then, then they had the gall, the white churches, to borrow the same sound and style, especially the Pentecostal, the old line Pentecostal, and a lot of the, a lot of the Southern Baptist churches, well, as time went on, right? Where are you going? You're finally going to end up at rock and roll. As Muddy Waters so succinctly said it, the blues had a baby and they named it rock and roll. And that's the truth. So you end up with this from day one all the way through. There's this attitude of control, of dominance, of wraith, wraithism, and of we are different than them. Except you started to sound a lot like them. (laughs) And them 
I'm them. <laughs> I don't look like you, or I mean, I don't look like these people that you, you've rejected, but, uh, you know, this, is, this goes way, way deeper than white folks in traditional churches who don't like rock music. It's way deeper than that. On behalf of those imprisoned by the state, or locked up by the shame of their own fate, let me tell you. You can be Barabbas, you can be Barabbas, you can be Barabbas too. You can be Barabbas, you can be Barabbas, you can be Barabbas too. You can be Barabbas, you can be Barabbas, you can be Barabbas too. You can be Barabbas, you can be Barabbas, you can be Barabbas too. If the Jesus movement is is coming out of the '60s and the values of the '60s and the civil rights movement and uh, making things better, but with Jesus in the gas tank, as it were. And now that Christian rock, Jesus music has become Christian rock and this stuff, how is it so disconnected from that that you guys and other bands are out there and facing persecution, not as much from the secular world, but from the church over the fact that there's this latent racism? The problem is that I think so much of this stuff goes right back to economics and power again. And those young bands and solo artists had to eat. John Fisher years ago said about the Jesus music scene, he wrote it in CCM, in his, col in his CCM magazine, in his column. He said, we used to make history, now we're making a living. There's a lot of breakdowns. Uh, there's a lack of accountability on both ends. There's a lack of mutual respect. Living in community like I do, you know, how many people do you know that don't have to worry where their next meal's coming from and are free to do whatever art they really have a sense they need to do? The average person has to do all the stuff. I don't live in the same world that many followers of Jesus in those days and since. You know, I'm, I'm sitting in a building with a record label next door that does all the work for me, a professional studio with two rooms upstairs, and I don't have to worry about basically paying the bills. And, and we choose, my wife, we, she's ha we're happy to live in one room, and I got another room that's an office. There came a point where people got married, started having kids, and all of a sudden, the pain of capitalism, I'm convinced it's a calling, you pay the price whatever the price is. In the early days, people were happy in a burned out old station wagon, throw in all the gear, squeeze in in between, you know, the roof and the, and the amps <laughs> and the, the speaker cabinets, you know, and take turns driving so hopefully nobody dies, driving a couple hundred miles to a little church and they take up a love offering, you get a spaghetti dinner and you leave with 25 bucks. If you're not committed if you're not passionate about the Lord, the people, if you're not willing to eat a lot of peanut butter, you know, and casseroles and just deal with it, there's a point, too, where what does the culture say you should have? What, what does happiness look like? What does personal fulfillment and success look like? Uh, again, I'm back to Steve Taylor. Questioning success on the first Res album, Golden Road. That was what Golden Road was all about. The failure of success. The, the more is never enough. So, you know, choosing a simple lifestyle and then maintaining it 10, 20, 30, 40 years down the track, you know. What must I have? But back then, let me tell you, the people that did it and kept on doing it, there were a lot of reasons why. There were a lot of reasons. And uh, as time went on, the pain, I think financially, uh, as well as the rejection that a lot of them felt and, and got, you know. You have to be really committed or you finally just bail.
I have this theory about what I call the rock and roll fantasy, right? That came out of the '70s and '80s. You're gonna you're gonna be a celebrity and you're gonna be a big star, and you're entitled to all these things. You guys were operating at a really high level by the mid '80s with the lights, with the amps, on a stage, blasting, but singing songs about tearing all of that stuff apart. Like it was all about disassembling that fantasy. And you were taking that countercultural energy from the 60s and you were seamlessly blending it with the gospel and you would get out at the end of the stage at some point of the night and say, I'm all this stuff, it's all gonna burn. <laughs> I was just like, you know, it was just so different. It was such a different thing than. You guys have been a, a solid known touring recording band for at least a decade by the time we get to the mid 80s. And, and one of the more well-known in the, in the subgenre of Christian rock and roll. How much of your brain was occupied by the outreach aspect of what we're singing about and trying to reach people with the gospel? And how much of it was like, I want our music to be good, or I, wanna, I want this new record to sound great, or I just had an idea for a song and we have to bring it to life. How much of that, I'm, I'm always fascinated by like how the art is merging in your mind with the mission, maybe, is the way to put it. Where was your head in all that? Well, I never saw, Chris, I never saw a dichotomy between genuineness and integrity of the message of lyrics and actually connected with your life, okay? I never saw a dichotomy between that and artistry, creative expression. Res Band, started arguably the first gig was the band was called charity early on and then we morphed into full-blown rock uh within about three months december 12th 71 and by somewhere along the line of march or very early april 72 up until we recorded the first album awaiting reply in 78 we always cared about the production uh the arrangements of the songs all of it, everything that has anything to do with what you would consider art and artistry, it was never a matter of just throw it out there. Once we built our own studio, which by that time we had, we would take roughly a month, probably three weeks or more of rehearsal, and then a full month to record albums. There were several things going for us that piles of the Christian musicians in those days never had or rarely had, or they didn't have them all going for them, you know. So this was part of the leg up, but man, two legs up. I could tell you story upon story. So the humility factor and the, and that we're just people. We're just people. I guess I don't know if this is true or just lore I've heard, but it seemed like you guys by the mid 80s, between heaven and hell, around then, that's when I saw you on MTV. That's when it seemed like the powers that be may have come knocking on your door saying, hey, hey, let's take this next level. Let's make this, let's make this big. Let's go all the way. For a while, we worked with U2's North American management just for a few months. And we did a couple of pretty thorough tours, college and other places. There were some amazing moments, right? But for, for us, it was always, this is who we are. This is what we believe. You know, here's where we're at in our songs. We always wrote songs from day one about issues that often people in the church didn't want to talk about. And it wasn't just to get in their face, their face. The reception, in some cases, was absolutely killer. I have to tell you, one of the things we did on those tours that were considered secular tours, when MTV was kicking it out, every night we'd go out into the crowd. And I would literally, I mean, soak and wet at the end of the gig. And just put the towel around and grab a cold drink and sit down. We just got into conversations with people. 
So it's it's relationships. It's it's relational, even if it's short term, you know. So to me, that always that always meant most. I mean, I, look, there's a million bands. To be honest with you, I'm not enamored. I, I'm blown away by the skill, the artistry, the musical talents and gifts. Don't get me wrong. I'm not anti-art. I'm not fundamentalist in how I view art. But the person is so much more important than their produce. And if that's not where you're coming from, man, I wish the heck you'd get some gig where you're not influencing a pile of people every night. You know, there's a bunch of people out there who get it. And, and of course, sometimes people in the church do, and sometimes they don't. And I had no one to plead my case or blowing smoke in my old face Lost my grip in a slippery time I left my friends by the wayside And I was sure enough no friend of mine When you need to be rescued now well, Glenn, I, I just want you to know, I so admire you. I admire, I mean, I admire you as an artist and a musician. Your voice is still unbelievable and unparalleled. But I really admire your your faith and your expression of your faith. And it's, 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 it's always, every person I've ever talked about you or your band and just this interaction we've had and other things I've seen with you, you've just been so, you know, authentic is is not strong enough you're you're just absolutely true with a capital t and i i admire that well you're very you're very kind you're very kind chris i have to live with myself i ask forgiveness every day and i need to and that's only about the stuff i know i've messed up in hey i got one quick question this is just a fun one um but it'll go with uh a scene in the movie the kids are arguing about the band's name and is it resurrection band is it res band is it res and one of them says oh the label made them change it so tell us in a nutshell what's with the name resurrection band res band res what's the deal tell the kids in the movie tell the kids in 316 the true story about your band's name the true story is when we started it was charity within three months we went to full-blown rock the resurrection of Jesus, how much more power do you want when you're going to crank the amps up uh, and change the style full on, right? And then resurrection band. Uh, I'm not kidding you. We were called reservation band in Green Bay when a, a whole tribe of Native Americans showed up. Somebody blew it on a poster. <laughs> in Arkansas, in Arkansas, a black church had an outdoor gig. And, I mean, it was so sweet. The Fabulous Resurrections. You know. Nice. I like well, that. Well, nice. cool. <laughs> Resurrection Band. And then people would refer to us, would refer to us as Res Band. And then eventually just Res. And it was really uh, friends, fans that kept calling us these things, right? That's who we are. I mean, whatever. That, it never mattered. It's like, don't call us late for dinner, you know, whatever. <laughs> So the record label never made you do it because you were your own record label. <laughs> yeah, we. I can honestly say that none of the labels that we worked with up until we started Gur Records, they really didn't make us do anything. The honest truth is they didn't call the shots on any of that stuff. And, but of course, by that time, there were enough economics, there were enough unit sales per release that we were coming from a position of strength, a track record. Yeah. And had a built-in group of fans that were going to pretty much buy whatever we put out, and they all knew that. What advice would you give to, if you had run into our movie band, 316, on the road, somehow they'd come to your show and they said, we've got a band, a bunch of 16, 17-year-old boys, in a, in a Christian metal band, 1986, what advice well, would you have given them? Well, first of all, that what exact scenario them? happened a number of times. <laughs> right. Because I was in that uh, band. <laughs> sure. <laughs> that was me you're talking about. What about spiritual accountability? I mean, all the big bands travel with pastors, and they have Bible studies every day. And rules, too, you know? Like, no girls on the bus, stuff like that. 
What's your name, son? It's Eric. Your brother Eric's concerns, yeah, they echo the greats. You don't get into this business to party hardy and rock and roll, drink Bacardi and smoke a bowl. No, you do it to spread the good news of Jesus Christ, to make him famous. Uh, I, I remember a situation where we had uh, like uh, maybe one and a half days off and there was a, a local group in a town that shall remain nameless and they were you won't even name the towns now <laughs> you don't want to inf- you don't want to offend entire <laughs> yeah. towns this is a large this is a large one a big this is a big one and oh, okay. well and they said hey our mom's a believer she's she's our biggest fan and they're they're four piece metal band you know and they said we know you're off for a day or two and we're coming to the show Plus, we, they had us booked into their high school, and they, they knew we had about a day and a half off, and we, we do Bible studies every week. Could you come and lead the Bible study and, and just hang out all, all, all day Saturday with us and just hang out, you know? And so, sure, and so we did. And um, tell us about recording, tell us about record deals, tell us about touring, uh, what do you think about this, that, the other, whatever it might, might have been. So those conversations would just happen pretty naturally with people all the time. I mean, I remember standing with Charlie Peacock at a Christian festival, and I remember a guy came up, a young guy, and he was like, oh, you know, looking at me and Charlie, like, oh, no, you know, and uh, all enamored. And um, Charlie was about to move to Nashville. He had mentioned it to me, and I'd been praying for him for about a year about making that move. And this kid was so, like, hot to trot, man, I'm going to move to Nashville and do it. And he, and he looks up at me, and, and Charlie goes, what advice can, will you give me? You know, because I'm, I'm thinking about moving to Nashville and you know, do the music and the Christian music scene. And I looked at him. I turned to Charlie. I said, oh, ask man. him. He's about to move. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Chuck, Chuck, give him your number. <laughs> I passed him. And, 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 I, and I, I kid you not. He looks at Charlie, and in a split second, Charlie goes, "Don't do it." <laughs> and I start, I started laughing. I did like, <laughs> so I don't have to say anything here. So, Charlie, you know, commences in short, not in Glenn speak, but in short form. Really think about what you're doing. There are a lot of people that have gone shipwreck in their mm. faith, who went to Nashville yeah. to make it whether in Christian scene, mainstream industry, whatever, there are a million people out there. What are you bringing to the table that's mm. so special uh, that, that you think is going to actually secure you a, a way to make a living and pay the basic bills, whether it's songwriting or performing or both or whatever you want to do? There, there, you know. So he essentially said, unless God Almighty is calling you and you are convinced if you don't do this, it's just going to be the worst thing ever, and this is something God is moving in your heart. You got reasonable confirmation that it is. Wherever you're from, if you're in Podunk, Indiana, stay in Podunk, right. Indiana. You know. You know, one of the, the the best things about that conversation uh, with you, me, Daniel, and Glenn Kaiser is, uh, to me, just like when Glenn speaks, he sounds so real and credible. Like even if you don't, uh, well, if you don't like his music or you don't like his religion or you don't like his politics, I mean, you 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 definitely see him as. I mean, he's not on the take, you know, <laughs> like right. he, he's not, there's no angles other than just, I'm, you know, to me, he's still in the middle of the Jesus movement, you know, in the sixties and seventies and, and just living it, you know, it's really, I don't know that I've ever met anybody quite like Glenn Kaiser. Well, I have over the years. I mean, actually Daniel's uh, father, Lenny Smith, who wrote, our God Reigns, which you hear a little bit and you'll hear it's kind of... Yeah, that's right. Um, he's from that same era and has yes. that same 
uh, heart, you know, and um, there was a there was a different spirit before industry got involved before it was record sales and that there was definitely you you hear it in in you know what glenn was talking well and about. glenn says that doesn't he he says yeah. he says you know eventually uh what do you say he said you know people got married and you know needed to make yeah. a living and you know uh, there's some just life realities that come into play at that point but i i have to say that a man of 316 had stayed together <laughs> <laughs> and right. had gotten that record contract, you know, I I would love well, for them to, may, they might have opened for Res Band, who knows? You know, yeah. But tell me this, Chris, when you were writing this and thinking about this, and I'm, I've mm-hmm. been curious about this, and the way the way you created Skip's character and the, the position mm-hmm. that you put them in, the scene that we heard there uh, just now, uh, it seems like, you know, we hear that ministry heart of what's going on with Glenn and, you know, that, that Jesus rock uh, era. How much of that were you aware of uh, when you wrote this and that that Skip kind of seems a little bit like he's selling a, a car to somebody, you know, when he's ta- <laughs> when he's talking about this mm-hmm. stuff. You think that um, it seems to me that Eric, Eric and Michael have had some of this invested in them in the past and maybe they miss it and they're looking for Eric's clearly looking for some kind of leadership like that. But Skip's not the guy that's going to take him there, is he? Well, the and 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 hopefully uh, in season two we'll talk to Brian Baumgartner about this in, in, this very thing. So um, so writing a character like a Skip Wick uh, at the core of it is Skip Wick. It wants to be good. So you know something that Brian and I talked a lot about is Skip really does believe all the things that you know um, a Christian would believe. He is a Jesus follower. He wants people to hear the gospel and get saved. That's all in Skip. What's also with Skip is he's a very um, troubled man. <laughs> he's very complicated. He's got a lot of, we would call them today, issues he's dealing with. So that core of, of Skip is, is often, uh, it doesn't, it's not able to, uh, get out there. That that core is not what's is not what's driving Skip. I think, as we as I wrote the um, the different characters in the band, the different guys, I kind of put them all on a different place as far as their spiritual maturity and their their goals uh, for their faith. And that spectrum, I guess, what I didn't really think about, but you know, what I didn't know is I I didn't know a lot about. The Jesus movie, or the the birthplace of what we know as Christian rock music, I more knew the the mid to late '80s version of Christian rock, which was certainly very commercial, and as you you've pointed out, was a Chris, Christian entertainment complex. You know, it was like a right. place where Christians came to get to pay for Christian entertainment, and so uh, I think there was a sheen over it all. There was a, a layer to it that that probably seemed a little used car salesman, a little a little false to some people. Yeah. When people look at Christian rock and they see something that seems dysfunctional, I think there's uh, they're right about some of it because the agenda of the people behind the mechanism was about the agenda, the the propagation of a ideology, uh, a set of propositions. Um, the kids getting involved in making the music, they didn't necessarily know that getting into it. And I think you really captured that. You just got kids want to be in a rock band, they want an audience. And faith and spiritual development is a, is a spectrum and, and maturity comes much later, you know? And so I like the fact that these are kids that are pretty decent as a rock band, but as far as you know humanity goes even glenn it would tell you that that maturity comes in the context of community and it comes over time you need people around you that are you know kind of reading your mail a little bit for a while and they just never had a chance to to get that and that i really love well, about the story and it also makes your music better when you got people around you saying you could do better you know <laughs> that's, kind that's of that true kind of that's true <laughs> from what you know because i know you know a lot of these guys and you've done a lot of research into that time when is Eric's idea that the the bands, you know, the big bands have pastors that travel with them and there's spiritual accountability? Is that true? I, I, it was. I, it, I wrote it, was it to, to as extent, kind of a yeah. myth. 
No, 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 no. That like Striper true. actually traveled with a, a, a guy that I know here in Nashville for for a long time. Yeah, there, there are a lot of those bands brought a person on the bus with them that you know often functioned as a, a spiritual mentor. Uh, sometimes they did other jobs, a chaplain kind of a role. Um, sometimes the road manager kind of took on that job. Yeah. Early on, the bands didn't have enough money coming in, and some bands like Servant and res band they were really an extension of a community anyway so it, it there was somebody in the band that had that role um, most of the bands i knew early on their their efforts included taking time every day for bible study and prayer and team building kind of stuff um so no that was definitely not uh, he was right on and he probably when i was helping you with the you know just kind of looking over the script and seeing if anything seemed out of place that was right in line with what we always heard when we yeah. went to places like Cornerstone and Glenn said, if you want to be successful on the road, make sure that you're holding each other accountable, that you're not, you know, taking girls on the bus, that, you know, all that kind of stuff. That was that was super right. common, uh, well-known kind of stuff. So, yeah, no, that was very believable. Now, didn't happen all the time, but that was certainly the goal that the, the serious-minded, ministry-minded uh, Christian bands would uh, hold themselves to for sure. It's a it's it's really fascinating. I mean, again, I I only knew that world as a consumer, a youth group kid that 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 really did like a lot of the music. But it, it when you go back and and compare notes with just the quote unquote real rock and roll world or the the secular world, it was there was there were certainly some similarities, but the the there were deep cultural differences um, yeah. deep inside the organizations of bands and artists. That, that are that are fascinating to to think about and look at now the church culture seemed to think every artist should be a pastor you know every artist who everybody that plays guitar mm. should also be able to uh, evangelize and build disciples now yeah we're all called to uh, some level of discipleship but I don't think everybody's given the gift of preaching and boy I sat through some really terrible sermons because every rock band thought that they had to <laughs> deliver a sermon Christian at some bands. point yeah oh my gosh I, I mean and so when I was running the True Tunes Club and you know we did 500 concerts or something over a span of years when I told bands they would come in and you know before the night they so do we do we have to do a, a, a sermon and I'd say absolutely mm -hmm. not you definitely don't have to do anything you don't want to do all I ask is you don't swear you know if you can help it mm -hmm. and don't hurt anybody you know and um but when they found out that they didn't have to preach it was like i had taken this burden off their back now some of them mm -hmm. gave some really powerful stories they would tell and um that yeah. was some of that weird culture and then what happens is you're pushing somebody to do something they're not equipped to do they're not they're not good at doing and they crack you know and things uh cracked all the time That's going to do it for this episode of the Electric Jesus Podcast. For more information about the Electric Jesus Film, visit electricjesusfilm.com and make sure to sign up for the email list, also known as the G's Team. You should also check out the Electric Jesus YouTube channel and Facebook groups for great behind-the-scenes videos, updated information about the film, and more. All links are available on the show notes page. This podcast is produced by myself, John J. Thompson, and Bruce A. Brown for Gyroscope Productions and is intended for the private use of our listening audience. Everything on the Electric Jesus podcast is used by permission or under fair use provisions and with the exception of previously copywritten materials is the intellectual property of Blue Tape Records, LLC, and is protected by U.S. copyright law. Next time on the Electric Jesus podcast, we get to spend time with a true expert on the Christian rock universe Heaven's Metal Magazine founder and editor, Doug Van Pelt. And together, we zero in on the strange musical subgenre that animates our character's journey in Electric Jesus. Doug will give us an insider's tour of the real scene back in the 1980s, a decade when Christian rock really started to roll. There was very much this scene, and for a minute, one explanation might be, well, maybe this was a move of God for a season. Maybe this really was a move of God, in a sense. There's another factor in there, this invisible factor that, that seemed to bless this uh, this scene that, that exploded before our eyes. We all saw it happen. 
Hi, this is Doug Van Pelt of the Texas Department of Licensing and Regulation. I understand you're not licensed to do this. You don't have a podcasting license in the state of Texas. We're going to shut down the internet on this podcast, buddy. Mm-hmm.